This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Supercharged How 3D Printing Will Drive Your Supply Chain by Len Panay. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Chapter 3 Where is 3D Printing Heading? During its first two decades as a tool for rapid prototyping, the types and durability of materials, quality, cost, and speeds of 3D printing meant that, that it wasn't suitable for really any other purpose. Engineers and designers came to embrace its ability to make prototypes for confirming form, fit, and function, or simply having something to show people. Enthusiasts were more ambitious, and they set about thinking of what else could be done. Since then, the original set of materials has expanded. The range of technologies and their characteristics and capabilities have widened, and the competence of designers has deepened. The result is that 3D printing has stepped outside of its rapid prototyping sphere into mainstream manufacturing. That 3D printing has already changed many industries is clear. It is an established production technique in sectors from transport and jewelry to dentistry and space, and more sectors are adopting it. To better realize its disruptive effect, significant improvement is needed in the three main technical areas of hardware, software, and materials. As those continue to mature, all engineering, manufacturing, and technology industries will be affected over the coming years if they haven't already been so. Given the billions of dollars in investment in these three areas, progress is practically assured sooner or later. Trying to divine how 3D printing will develop and where and what its impact will be requires looking at its past and current situation and then comparing those to how other technologies have evolved. The biggest change to affect the 3D printing market has been the shift of purpose. Increasingly, they are used for making jigs, fixtures, and injection molds for use with traditional manufacture, as well as considerable numbers of end-use items. Automotive manufacturer Volkswagen uses 3D printing to produce parts for the equipment that makes its vehicles, sometimes or something that has saved the company over 160,000 US dollars, with over 1,000 such parts made in the first year of that project. As this change of focus has taken hold, it has required a step change in the capabilities that have held 3D printing back for so long, from the ease of design to the precision and finish of parts made. This is significant as a business moves from startup to full production. The capabilities and performance levels that got it going and were good enough in the early days are simply not enough to sustain it as it ramps up. This chapter will examine the near-future developments in 3D printing and the areas where it will enter, expand, and mature, leveraging lessons from the recent history of other similarly disruptive technologies. It will look at the wider developments that are shaping supply chains and how 3D printing will fit into those. This, this will serve as a guide to supply chain decision makers on what to expect in the future. Integration and the Rise of the Robots 3D printing is a manufacturing technique with a series of stages, both virtual and physical. The virtual includes all the steps in the design phases, from initial drafting, through stress modeling, simulation, and so on. One of the often heard complaints among 3D print designers is that they need to move data across several software packages, each of which is used for one or a small handful of those steps, and each package has its own look and feel. As well as slowing down the design stages, this exposes the data to error and breaches. The actual fabrication process involves a series of physical steps, from loading the 3D printers, preparing the printer bed, and moving the fabricated parts to the next stage, and then onto a raft of post-production steps. The hazards of 3D printing, explored later in this book, mean that the intervention and use of human operators further slows down the end-to-end -end cycle times, as they wait for chambers to be cleared of powders, high currents to be powered down, and the like. Each step takes time to complete, slowing down the process. 
3D printer makers are increasingly addressing this, moving beyond simply developing the actual printers to providing wider integrated solutions, often in a modular way. With that approach, manufacturing supply chains will be scalable according to their needs, with a tangible gain in performance. As we mentioned in Chapter 2, design software providers are starting to unify the Computer-Aided Design, CAD, Computer-Aided Manufacturer, CAM, and Computer-Aided Engineering, CAE, and other software platforms into a single package in a common environment. Makers of 3D printers such as 3D Systems, EOS, and Additive Industries are now integrating their offerings and incorporating automation in their newer releases. Additive Industries' Metal Fab 1, for example, is a single system that integrates material loading, powder bed fusion 3D printing, and post-production using a high level of automation. Once the design data has been sent to the system, it fabricates them and moves through the production stages in a seamless manner. This has the benefit of accelerating production, as well as reducing risks to human operators. The production and post-processing chain is shortened from two hours to six minutes, which also cuts the cost and increases the sustainability of manufacturing. Other 3D printer providers are working closely with robotics developers to assist with the loading of material canisters, items that often weigh more than the recommended and legal limits for human workers to lift. Indeed, when combined, 3D printing and robotics offer supply chains a powerful combination, automated production that can operate with minimal human needs, reducing costs and disruptions, and therefore increasing productivity. This has opened up new capabilities during the production process. For instance, 3D Systems Figure 4 production series similarly coalesces the different stages of the 3D print process into a single unit and employs robotics to move materials and parts through it. Additionally, the firm has added a robotic arm to hold up a fabricated part to a laser scanner, which then checks that the finished item matches the de geometry of the intended design within the acceptable tolerances. These combined capabilities are being used by commercial companies in their operational models. Voodoo Manufacturing, for example, headquartered in Brooklyn, New York, built a 3D printing factory with over 200 machines that have already logged over a million printer hours, producing over 400,000 plastic parts. Its, singest, its biggest single order to date consisted of 22,000 items. Voodoo installed racks of fused deposition modeling 3D printers in their unit, offering customers two maximum sizes of printing envelopes and producing items in volumes and at costs that challenge injection molding. To achieve this, Voodoo uses visually assisted low-cost UR10 robotic arms placed in front of the racks that automate some of the simpler but typically labor-intensive labor tasks such as placing the print beds in the machines, removing the parts once they're made, still on the bed, and placing them on a conveyor for post-processing. This enables production to run continuously, with lights out, increasing productivity and reducing the costs per item. A digital launch pad. In 1962, Sam Walton opened a store in Rogers, Arkansas, a small town in what was a quiet state. His assistant in the venture, Bob Bogle, who had been given the task of looking after signage for the store, suggested the name that quickly became known across the USA and beyond, Walmart. The company went public in 1970 and grew year on year, and by 1975 it had a network of 125 stores across the country, with a turnover of 340 billion US dollars, all based on the promise of low prices and great service. That year saw the company do something unexpected. It purchased an IBM computer, the 370 over 135 system, to control its inventory across warehouses and distribution centers. It also used the system to prepare income statements for each of its stores, 
previously a particularly laborious manual task. To help feed information into that system, it also installed electric point-of-sale EPOS devices, cash registers, at over 100 of those stores, giving the visibility of what was selling and where it was being sold. This enhanced data flow allowed it to ramp up sales, and within four years it was a billion dollar firm, something it achieved in record time. The success that Walmart had at using computing power and data analytics to transform its operations and, from those, its business performance was instrumental in bringing IT into businesses in all industry sectors. Developments in technologies, from the advent of the internet, data processing tools and the cultural exception of digital innovations in operations slowly extended and deepened those changes. The early part of the 21st century then saw a shift in the pace of those changes. Today, Organizations are at the center of a perfect storm of technologies and societal changes that is rapidly transforming or radically transforming their ways of working, driven by the ever-present need of responsiveness, adaptability, and speed in supply chain operations. At the heart of, their tra of that transformation is the use of data to produce information and to make correct, right decisions. This, then, is digital transformation, the change to operations, processes, and systems, to how people interact with them, and to culture them through the use of data. The impact of this transformation has been emerging in different areas of the supply chain for several years. 1. Supply chain planners who use data analytics to optimize where to place elements of their operations or to develop algorithms that predict demand from a range of different signals. 2. Buyers who employ digital tools for e-procurement, running cloud-based reverse auctions to accelerate purchasing cycle times while reducing prices. 3. Manufacturers who began to bring CAD systems into traditional production, such as with computer numerical control CNC, machining, and five-axis milling. 4. Logisticians who employ electronic picking assistance in warehouses and GPS-enabled tracking devices to understand how their inventories are moving. Now, all these developments are aimed at helping businesses better understand their customer needs and to meet those requirements, to optimize supply chains at the best cost, and to bring control to those supply chains enhancing the business's bottom lines. To gather that data, the physical elements of supply chains, from machinery to vehicles, are increasingly fitted with sensors connected via computer networks. This is the so-called Internet of Things, which sees the prospect of billions of items, from cars to refrigerators, being connected online. Placing remote sensors in physical systems to collect information about their operation is not new, having been the norm for decades in most industrial sectors. Neither is the use of data analytics to provide insight, as seen in the Walmart example. What is different is the scale of the data that is produced, and the speed with which that happens. By 2015, more data has been created in the preceding two years than in the whole of human history. By 2017, 90% of the world's data, 2.5 quintillion bytes, that's 2.5 times 10 to the 18th power, has been created in the previous two years. Whew. This is big data, and it is changing how companies work and how they make decisions in all areas, particularly in the supply chain. This is the latest step change in emerging technologies and how they're used, and it is leading to a revolution in industry. Over the last 200 years, manufacturing has undergone three such step changes in capability, each driven by technology. First, in the early 1800s, the use of mechanization, powered by steam and water, enabled factories to transform the highly manual processes that they had used for nearly 1,000 years, significantly accelerating production times. This was particularly evident in the cotton mills of northern England and in agriculture globally. This was so-called Industry 1.0. Next, 
at the beginning of the 20th century was brought mass manufacturing to factories, with pioneers like Henry Ford and William Klan improving the processes to increase volumes of manufacture. This was Industry 2.0. Then, in the latter half of the 20th century, we saw the advent of computers, and more recently, automation in factories, realizing Industry 3.0. Now, we are on the cusp of the next stage, Industry 4.0. This concept arose from the work of Siegfried Dye, of Robert Bosch Gamb, and Henning Kagerman, of Akatech, who were initially commissioned by the German government. Industry 4.0 brings all the previous advancements together with a systems engineering approach, producing cyber-physical systems, systems that seamlessly integrate digital and physical technologies. At first glance, this may not seem new. For decades, companies have been using sensors to produce data that is then analyzed to inform decisions and improve performance. However, the depth breadth and scale of technologies throughout all areas of operations means that Industry 4.0 goes far beyond what was possible before, and those operations that employ it well become better utilized, characterized by highly flexible production and strong customization. Those aspects require manufacturing approaches that are highly flexible and allow for mass customization beyond what has been achievable with traditional techniques those are precisely the capabilities of 3D printing. With its lean production, which can be outsourced and automated, 3D printing is now seen as a key enabler of the new paradigm. To understand what this means, lessons can be learned from other recent technology developments, such as the advent of personal computers, PCs. This is an important section. Although computers have been around since the late 1940s, it wasn't until the arrival of Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Bill Gates in the 1970s that they became PCs, entering business and homes in far greater numbers than they had until then. Despite their versatility and, at that time, advanced technology, PCs were initially seen as something for the hobbyists, for geeks and nerds, something to program to do cool things, from playing Pong and Space Invaders to calculating logarithmic tables quickly. Magazines dedicated to providing these, those hobbyists with programs, hints, and tips appeared, and a subculture soon emerged. That trend continued on during the 1980s, with personal computers slowly making headway into business, as well as within that geek community. However, as companies began to use them, they found that they were limited, that the realities of their capabilities did not match their promise. The machines were difficult to use, required training to code and run. It was not possible to exchange data between them without expensive infrastructure investment to lay dedicated cables. Then, in 1989, something extraordinary happened. Sales of PCs actually fell. The year-on-year -year downward trend continued until a series of developments in the early 1990s. First, Microsoft released Windows 3 in 1990 and 3.1 in 1992, building on the more user-friendly but less commercially successful operating systems that rival company Apple offered, which made using computers easier. Around that time, inkjet and laser printers became more portable and affordable, allowing them to be easily installed in homes and offices. Alongside this, in December of 1990, we witnessed something that would go on to change everything. The debut of the first website on the newly created World Wide Web, which itself was opened to the public by its creators at CERN in Switzerland in April of 1993. The web allowed for communication between PCs on telephone wires, opening up the ability to network systems. The PC sector soon recovered its past growth trend, catalyzed by the coming together of all four of those developments. 3D printing is following a similar trajectory. There is now a tangible need for 3D printing, and the technical elements are coming together to fully realize its potential. The, mark the march toward digital transformation 
transformation and the expansion in the use of Industry 4.0 solutions will catalyze the adoption of 3D printing in supply chains in the same way that the advent of the easier-to-use software platforms, the internet, and the availability of printers changed how office-based work could be delivered, propelling the adoption of PCs in all areas of business. It will open the digitization of sectors that previously have been held back from being transferred. Sidebar. That's a really interesting comparison of those trends. Okay. Shifting dynamics of the 3D printing sector. The hype of 3D printing has died down, and there is far more pragmatism about what it is and what it can do. So, with 3D printing already a present element in many manufacturing process, what will catalyze its further adoption, helping it to achieve the potential that so many see for it? In the short run, the biggest innovations that will really ramp up the use of 3D printing lay in the area of materials, making items with several materials and in many colors in one go. The inclusion of conductive materials, such as copper or more exotic materials, like voxelate's conductive inkjets, within the structure of a 3D printed object, thereby enabling transmission of electrical currents or the embedding of electrical circuits, will explode the number of uses for 3D printing. This is likely to happen soon, with the successes of 3D printing carbon nanotubes already showing promise. In parallel, Improving the economics of 3D printing will also be a critical factor. This was key to the adoption of other disruptive technologies, such as the PC and mobile phones, which took off when their price tags shrank significantly while their capabilities increased, offering what was perceived as a good value for the money. This reduction in cost is likely to stem from increased competition between makers of 3D printers and the arrival of new entrants, as well as from cheaper materials, resultant from the expanded research and development in the area. To scale that, there were 49 manufacturers of 3D printers in 2014, which has now doubled to 97 in 2016. Since the main patents have lapsed, the costs of machines have been reduced by a factor of 10, and their precision and accuracy have increased. As costs of 3D printing further drop, manufacturing will increasingly become a commodity, enabling small companies as well as large corporations to make items quickly with low investments. Likewise, those firms that acquire the right makers of 3D printers, particularly for niche purposes, and turn them to their advantage will have a tangible competitive edge. This is driving mergers and acquisitions in the 3D printing space. Just in 2016, General Electric acquired Arkham and SLM Solutions for 14 billion US dollars. Siemens bought Material Solutions LTD and HP purchased David Vision Systems, GMBH, and David 3D Solutions. As more manufacturers embrace the technology and install the equipment in their factories, there will be a shift in where the producers of 3D printers obtain their revenues. As has been the case in other sectors, aftermarket services for 3D printers will be where the money is, through materials, maintenance, and repairs. In many sectors employing that model, 80% of revenues are generated through operational expenditures, not capital, and there is no reason to think that 3D printing will be any different. However, there is still plenty of potential for 3D printer sales, and hardware sales will continue to dominate in the shorter term. According to Wohlers, there has been a growing demand for 3D printers for many years, and 2017 saw a 21% increase in 3D printer sales overall, with metal 3D printers rising by 80%. Beyond industrial printing, it is worth a short observation about consumer 3D printing, the idea that technology will see developments like those witnessed by the PC and two-dimensional printer, and that someday we'll have 3D printers in our own homes. As mentioned in the introduction, this is not covered in this book. However, much as the development of the PC 
and in 2D printer for home use drove changes in the capabilities, sales, and prices of those items, it is quite conceivable that if a company were to enter the home market, the 3D printing sector would undergo a similar change. The challenge here is that consumers are impatient, wanting things when they need them, not hours later. They are largely unskilled, so using CAD is not an option. They want something reliable, with at least some level of quality assurance, and 3D printing is not yet able to provide those with the lower prices that home use would need. Last, the narrower material capabilities of 3D printers for this foreseeable future means that there won't be the flexibility in what can be produced to make 3D printing something for the home. Were those dynamics to change, however, then 3D printing would certainly be more pervasive everywhere. The development of 3D printing technologies has long been shaped by a pursuit to resolve its many constraints, from cost and accuracy to material properties and production speeds. However, as 3D printing continues its transformation from a tool for rapid prototyping to industrial production, there is an increased realization that these fa factors need to be traded off, that particular 3D printing technologies can be suitable for some of those needs, but that no one technology, much less a single 3D, 3D printer, will be able to resolve all the challenges of speed, cost, precision, materials properties, and part size at the same time. This will inevitably lead makers of 3D printers to diversify their offerings, employing developments in technology and materials to give supply chains a choice of solution to meet their particular needs. It is likely to also see a fragmentation of the 3D printing sector, with new entrants focusing on a small configuration of those offerings. For instance, the firm Apis Core, founded in Russia in 2014, provides mobile construction 3D printers specifically for producing whole buildings. The long-established German engineering company, Bego GmbH & Company, produces the Varseo S 3D printer, specifically for applications in dentistry, using stereolithography to make casts, guides, and temporary dental fixtures. New uses are also driving these developments. For instance, the desire to be able to 3D print fully working multi-material objects with embedded electronics is driving developments in 3D printing processes to produce the necessary precisions and tolerances, as well as materials, with some researchers successfully using carbon nanotubes to achieve those. Where next? In the short term, the, sector, the sectors that will see the most penetration from 3D printing are the transport sectors, principally aerospace and automotive, and healthcare, both medical and dental. These sectors have been using 3D printing for decades. The operating models of the transport sector involve a high number of parts that need to support long-lived platforms. Those parts often need some adjustment to fit the specific platform and, being long-lived, that leads to, to a high risk of obsolescence, a high cost of making parts in lots of one, and a high cost to store all that inventory. Aerospace companies currently use 3D printing to accelerate the manufacture of parts from GE's fuel nozzles to back-of-seat tray brackets, and that is expanding to other components from air ducts to support struts and even jet engine blades. The automotive sector, the earliest adopter of 3D printing, already uses the technology to produce new designs and prototypes. For example, the Ford Motor Company produced its millionth 3D printed component in 2015. Beyond that, the automotive sector is moving toward incorporating 3D printing in its after-sales market, providing spare parts for service centers, something many aerospace firms have ambitions of doing and potentially directly to customers. The vision is that customers will soon no longer have to go into an, au an auto service center and wait for two or three days for a part to be shipped across the country, or even imported. Rather, the service center will be able to produce the spare part to order, 
either on-premises or at a nearby 3D printing center. Mercedes-Benz Trucks announced that it will be providing a 3D-printed spare part service, following a similar initiative at Audi, starting with 30 parts for the Actros series of trucks in September of 2016. Other sectors with similar characteristics are following close behind, such as oil and gas, mining, and defense. Capital-intensive sectors where equipment has a very long life cycle, typically decades. In the healthcare sectors, the capabilities of 3D printing to produce items that are customized to the patient, e.g. training models, implants, or supports, and to do so competitively, give it a tangible benefit. The advent of bioprinting also offers exciting possibilities, promising to revolutionize medicine. For example, Eric Gattenholm, founder of bioprinting film Cell Inc., said in 2017 that his goal has always been, quote, to change the world of medicine. It was as simple as that. And our idea is to place our technology in every simple single lab around the world, end quote. Being able to reduce the number of times a patient visits the dentist for an implant or to adjust braces results in happier patients and more productive doctors. The greater freedom of location that 3D printing offers opens up the opportunity for its use in humanitarian situations, providing mass health care where this wasn't previously possible. Naturally, the significant role that 3D printing plays in rapid prototyping will continue to expand. Even the fast-moving consumer goods sector already uses the technology for the production of prototypes of new packaging, for example. As those companies have found, the advantages of fast redesign and production mean that market research will increasingly make use of 3D printing to give customers the look and feel of potential new designs. Iterating those designs with customer feedback will be carried out far more quickly and cheaply than has ever been possible. However, it is in mainstay manufacture that 3D printing has the biggest potential to significantly redraw supply chain operating models, especially in those sectors where there is a need for personalization, whether due to the purpose of the object or the desire of customers. In sectors such as jewelry, fashion, and consumer goods, the availability of unique designs is a part of customer wants, and 3D printing can provide for that via its lot of one capability, with little or no increase in the cost per item than for higher volume production runs, provided the added design burdens can be overcome. Several designers in those sectors are using it, including jewelers Chanel and Guy and Max, and sports shoemaker Adidas, and many others are considering it to expand the number of variations to their products, from having more colors to customizing decorations, with little increase in cost and little impact on time to manufacture. Moreover, those designs can be evolved and changed rapidly with little time between cycles. Taken to its extreme, this opens the possibility of jewelry and fashion products that are bespoke and customized to the individual person. <clears throat> in 2014, Avi Reichenthal, the former president and CEO of 3D Systems, said in a TED Talk, quote, You all know your shoe size. How many of you know the size of the bridge of your nose or the distance between your temples? Wouldn't it be awesome if you could get eyewear that fits you perfectly and doesn't require any hinge assembly, so chances are that the hinges are not going to break? End quote. It isn't only in manufacturing goods directly that 3D printing is making headway. The use of 3D printers to make casts and molds for high-volume manufacture is an accelerating trend, one already bringing huge benefits. By using the technology, the mold and cast designs can be iterated faster to arrive at the final form more quickly, and hence more cheaply, than using traditional approaches. The manufacturer, Sufer, which makes parts for household appliances and commercial vehicles, has been using 3D printers for over three years to produce injection molds. They have achieved a 97% reduction in the cost to produce each mold, 
and the time to make one has fallen from eight weeks to a few days, including design, which allows them to iterate those designs several times without previous constraints on cost and time. The performance of those parts, in terms of the pressures and temperatures that the molds work with, has been commensurate to those that were traditionally machined. 3D printing is already a more capable set of technologies than many of those working in supply chains realize, with the benefits that it brings in the future course that the technologies and the industry dynamics are indicating, understanding how to access 3D printing capabilities and what the different options for that are set the scene for describing how 3D printing will drive supply chains. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.